I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2022. Millennials have weathered multiple recessions, a pandemic, and the burden of explaining to Pope Francis why we've opted for fur babies instead of human ones. Infants just don't go viral like miniature greyhounds do. Reality is, the dog parent generation has experienced slower economic growth than any other in U.S. history. And that's translated to lower earnings, lower wealth, and needing to affirm our preference for chew toys instead of diapers. Millennials even have a euphemism to refer to responsibilities associated with major milestones. Adulting. An indication that things like marriage and homeownership are either extremely delayed or a foreign concept to this economically stunted generation. See that little squiggle way down at the bottom there? That represents millennials' real estate net worth, which is why it's unsurprising that most millennials are either renting or living with family, given the rising cost of everything from gas to housing to lavender oat milk lattes due to inflation, or what happens when costs outweigh buying power. The last raise I got was in 2016. Stewart's budget hasn't really changed over the years, but what she can afford has changed. Why? Inflation. The cost of living creeps up steadily every year. It always does, a little bit, with food, bills, and transportation usually getting anywhere from 1% to 3% more expensive. But this year, so far, the inflation rate has jumped above 6%. During the pandemic, a lot of people began to leave, and actually the rent dropped that year by $100. I am due to renew my rent, and there was a spike of $400. And when you combine a recession with a pandemic and a stalled supply chain, <laughs> inflation is like, hey, let's party. <laughs> Except no one can afford to go to that party. One thing that I've noticed that has skyrocketed recently is fast food. I think that fast food used to be something that was really cheap and affordable. I used to go to the grocery store with $50 and walk out with a week worth of food and now it's it's not the same. I think some of the prices that sky, have skyrocketed have been things like ride shares, for example, Uber, and also rent prices. Over the past two years, the median American income fell 3%, while the cost of living rose nearly 7%, due in large part to rising housing and medical costs. And it's no revelation that low-income Americans are impacted the most by this. So pensioners, the elderly, the poor, the young, people who have not entered the, uh, you know, their, their working life, those, uh, those groups are always the, the, the worst off. So you know, it's sometimes said that you know, inflation is a tax on the poorest. And, and in a sense, that's true. It also hurts people who were planning a major purchase, like a home or a car, and have to finance it, because it means that typically the, 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 the rates go up. I just wanted to point out the, the, the winners and the losers. Inflation is happening on a global scale. And while its impacts can be economically devastating for many, for others, it's the opposite. Inflation has winners and losers. And the constituencies that win when inflation occurs and, and when interest rates go up are by and large savers and lenders. And that's because they can get a higher return as, as inflation rises and interest rates rise. Now, you know, what, a group that tends to complain a lot about inflation, they say they're losers, are manufacturers and retailers, because that's the place where the rubber hits the road and, the, and, and businesses have to, have to jack up their prices. When I hear their arguments, I think, well, those are crocodile tears because they know that once prices go up, they very rarely go down. Millions of mostly minimum wage workers quit their jobs during the pandemic because, as it turns out, an hourly job at a fast food chain requiring you to confront the worst of humanity but doesn't cover basic expenses wasn't worth dying for. This mass employee exodus with workers opting for higher pay and better working conditions has been dubbed the Great Resignation. And because employers are having to increase wages to entice potential employees, while also dealing with things like supply chain shortages, many have jacked up prices to ensure the consumer is footing the bill. So even though minimum wage workers have seen wages soar during the pandemic, any celebration has been intercepted by the highest inflation in 40 years. The baby boomers reaching retirement 
and the low birth rates, what's already going to cause a labor shortage, the pandemic just accelerated these uh, conditions. In terms of job losses when the pandemic hit, it happened in occupations that primarily are overrepresented by Latinos in like you know, food uh, service, hotels, right, leisure, hospitality, those industries. And so a lot of Latinos found themselves out of work for a reserve that looked at whether the bump in unemployment benefits from the CARE Act was preventing people from coming back to work. And they did not find any statistically significant evidence. Even though those states ended unemployment benefits early, they didn't get a bump in employment. And so all they did was really hurt people who were unemployed, who were relying on those, on those benefits. I think workers are discovering their voice again, right? And we are seeing more strikes where in jobs that have unions, but we're also seeing people, you know, vote with their feet by leaving work. But it's still very uneven in terms of worker, worker power because we still have a lot of companies who are flexing uh, market power to keep wages and quality of work down for workers. I think that this current labor movement that we're in is actually going to be an ongoing movement until we see actual change. We're hoping that it's not long lasting, but I don't think it's the end of it. We've been seeing it for hundreds of years in history. We know about famous strikes and I don't think it's gonna end anytime soon. The labor's movement is very old. It's not obviously not gonna stop now the same way it hasn't stopped in years since it started. You know, it's just something that is always going to be continuous. Of the 47 million workers who quit their jobs in 2021, many moved on in search of the obvious perks. More money, better hours, shorter commute, more flexibility, which is why the great resignation is better described as the great reshuffle. Because the same workers quitting their jobs were actually getting rehired elsewhere. But not everyone left the workforce by choice. Some were forced out. And the demographic that dropped out of the workforce at higher rates than any other during the pandemic? Latinas. Uh, women primarily uh, face the burden of care. And so we also saw, saw uh, large numbers of women exit the workforce, uh, even though they're in prime working age, because they have to care for children as schools closed or for elderly relatives. Some of the job gains have been in those same industries that, that we saw the job losses, leisure and hospitality, uh, food service, right, as, as restaurants open, as hotels open and so forth. But a lot of these parents could not come back to their jobs because now they had to take care of kids still because schools were still closed. And those were primarily Latina women. Latinas have been, women in general have been more impacted by this pandemic, but La Latinas in particular because of the fact that they lost their job and then they couldn't come back because now they had to take care of, 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 of kids. Many of us were hit hard by the pandemic, but one of the industries hit the hardest was the service industry, and particularly restaurants. I sat down with some employees of a popular Los Angeles restaurant to talk about how the pandemic impacted them economically. Hello, I'm Richard Sincheri. I'm the general manager of Tom Tom Bar and Lounge in West Hollywood, California. So Rich, what was work like before the pandemic? Uh, before the pandemic, we had plenty of people to work for us. If someone quit or someone was sick, I, you know, I had other employees that would fill in. What are some of the challenges you now face when it comes to staffing? So the qualified people understand their value. They want more pay and they just won't settle for it. You know, like, I mean, Case in point, and if I have people in the kitchen that I want to hire, now they're like, you know what? We won't work until the minimum wage goes up. You know, I'll work over here on this other side of town who's paying the same as you, and I don't have to make that commute. So I'm having to hire a lot of people, and I'm seeing a huge influx of people coming in, but they're not necessarily qualified. So, and everyone's shopping around now for the best jobs so they can secure that, that best job. And I think that that's where the restaurant industry is right now for me. It definitely seems like there's been a shift, like the power has shifted from the owners or the employers, you know, to the employees. They're like, okay, well, if we band together, we don't do it. I remember 
the day we closed. We thought we were gonna open. They shut us down at like 3.30. And you know, we thought we were gonna go home for two weeks. I was like, cool, I need a little break, a little vacation. It ended up being like 15 months we were closed. When unemployment came yeah. through, then, um, you know, you have money to live. And did you find it hard transitioning back once everything kind of opened back up? Obviously, like, you'd rather not work than work. Right. But I knew that the money that we were getting was going to end at some point. And mm -hmm. I, I've never been a fan of, like, um, you know, holding on to something till it's gone. It was kind of like muscle memory, but I was in way worse shape. Um, I was so exhausted right. because I went from not working for a little over a year or two right. full steam ahead five nights a week like right. 13 14 hour days it was a lot what do you think that this industry the service industry as a whole can do to kind of uh, give a better support to the employees listening being understanding um i think we're all trying to navigate like a very different world than we were two years ago. Right. Um, so I'd say if somebody comes to you with a concern or a criticism, like try to put yourself in their shoes and understand what they're dealing with. But low wage industries aren't the only ones impacted by the great resignation. Some industry professionals are taking advantage of this reshuffle to renegotiate their worth, with many calling for pay transparency across the board. Pay transparency is when employers or companies that are looking to hire are being really forthcoming, just very honest and communicative about what the compensation is gonna look like and not just yours, but also like across the company so that you're not wondering if your coworkers are making more money than you. And if they are, there should be a clear reason as to why. Anybody can look to see which of the Fortune 500 companies do this. Big names, Starbucks is doing this, Netflix is doing this. Right now there's this national conversation happening. I think the social media has played a big part of it where there are you know, tweets that have gone viral or um, TikToks that have gone viral of young people in the workplace finding out that for whatever one reason or another, whatever the reason is, they're not earning as much as their coworkers. There's a culture in the workplace of don't talk about what you make, don't ask your coworkers what they make. And that taboo around salary discussions adds to this constant status quo of young, younger workers not negotiating, not finding out what compensation is and what's fair compensation. And then it just perpetuates the way that things have been. It's interesting if employers are saying, no, we shouldn't have pay transparency. It's only gonna create some drama. It's gonna create negativity in the workplace. Then they are at fault of doing that. The mindset is shifting so much because of the fact that the pandemic put such a financial strain on workers that you, you almost have no choice but to prioritize your financial needs and your financial situation. If you're trying to buy a house, if you have student loans, if you're uh, taking care of your parents and previous generations, all of these financial things come into play when you are sitting at that negotiation table to try to you know negotiate for a higher salary. If there's some silver lining in the current economy, it's that more people are getting hired than are quitting their jobs. And wages are expected to keep increasing in 2022. Also, there are ways to protect ourselves during an inflation period and money to be made. Cash is not an ideal investment. It's not an ideal thing to have in excess at this point. So any cash that you don't need for emergency purposes should be invested in something. So TIPS stands for Treasury Inflation uh, Protected Securities, and they're essentially a security that you can buy that is tied to the inflation rate. So people are investing in these things that you buy from the federal government. So if you do have excess cash, that might be a strategic place to put it. Now it's important to understand that you're locking up your money essentially in exchange for having that interest paid to you. Now it's important to understand that there will be industries that may benefit from this inflationary environment versus others which may uh, suffer. So things like energy, energy costs are going up. So if you want to kind of ride that wave, something like an ETF that tracks an energy index 
might be a good uh, place for you to put some money. Real estate has also been traditionally an inflationary hedge. So you don't necessarily have to physically own real estate. You can actually invest in real estate through the stock market through something like a real estate investment trust or a REIT. So that's also another option for you to consider. Typically also commodities, right? So like um, we're talking about the cost of food going up. We're talking about the cost of energy and uh, things that are used to produce commercial consumer products. So any industries that are in those realms might be a good place for you to investigate, to, in, to invest in. Well, my career started as a promoter um, and then I went on to move to LA and work in music. And from there, I kind of just took a break, started my own thing and was doing events. So gifting came about actually because it was about June or July of the pandemic, right when quarantine started. Um, I was feeling really low. I couldn't throw any events. I was pretty lost and just upset, honestly. I got really inspired by a friend who sent me a birthday gift that came in three different boxes. I thought, okay, this could be way more sustainable, way more intentional. So it really just kind of triggered my desire to, again, want to bring people experiences. but this time in a different way that didn't have to be in person. When this idea first came about, I thought, okay, I'm diving in full force. And I quickly realized that I couldn't do it alone. So I contacted an amazing woman named Kathleen who I really looked up to. Um, she's an amazing fellow child of immigrants. Her parents are Chinese. And she really just helped me elevate not only this idea, but the mission as well. We really launched thinking that we would be this great consumer brand where you know we could house all of these diverse and inclusive brands in one place. So we source products from a wide variety of mission-driven companies. A lot of them are from minority-owned founders, so Black, Indigenous, people of color, members of the LGBTQ plus community, female-founded brands, uh, persons with disabilities. But we quickly realized that our contacts in the music industry and corporate clients were looking for something as well. So we expanded our mission to basically house anything socially responsible that we could do for these brands. We grew very fast, honestly, faster than we could keep up. This started as you know a quarantine project. We didn't think that it would become what it is today. We launched officially October 2020. And to date, we've done over a million dollars in sales. We you know, have expanded into a 3,000 square foot warehouse. This started out of my three bedroom apartment in West Hollywood. I think if we would have been scared to start this or scared to fail, nothing would have ever worked out. So as long as you're not afraid to fail, the sky really is the limit. With many economists saying government spending is partly to blame for the current inflation rate, it's safe to assume that government stimmies are off the table. But what else, if anything, can we do to speed up economic recovery? Higher minimum wages. I don't think the minimum wage right now is currently a living wage. I don't think it's enough to sustain what it takes to support yourself, potentially a family, um, and to pay rent and for groceries and everything that it costs to just live. I really hope that moving forward, we, we respect everyone, no matter how much they make or what position they have and just treat everyone fairly. I would like to see some form of implementation and benefits for student workers. So I have been in the online entrepreneurship space since 2013, and I honestly do believe it is the best place for most people to start an online business because the barrier to entry is so low. You can start an online business essentially for free with the internet and maybe a social media app. There are so many free and low cost tools for you to start marketing yourself, taking payments from people, and just setting up your business has been, it's an easier thing to do than ever before. That being said, I think it's essential for most people to at least consider having a side hustle because 2020 taught us anything. It was the even most stable jobs like, you know, healthcare and education. Those might not be around forever. Those jobs might not be as stable as we think. And so if you want to protect yourself from external forces, you need to have multiple income streams and having a side hustle is super important. So from that respect, I like to tell people, think about the things that you're known for. What are the things that people are always asking you about? That can be professionally, that can be you have really cool personal skills that you might be able to spin into a business. But I think everybody needs a side hustle and you never know what you can create until you start just putting yourself out there. While the costs of basic goods are rising, Millions of Americans are still feeling the crushing weight of student loans. 
And debt forgiveness is one way some advocates believe that Congress can help Americans through rising inflation. And who knows? Per the Pope's concern over cat parents, maybe it'll motivate younger generations to start making babies sooner again. Not gonna lie, being debt free is a huge turn on. And when it comes to medical costs, progressives argue that Congress simply allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices could make a huge difference. While in the private sector, billionaire Mark Cuban is creating an online pharmacy that would just offer affordable prescription drugs. Meanwhile, President Biden is still trying to convince folks that lowering drug prices is even a good idea. Because apparently people still need convincing that Americans shouldn't have to go bankrupt for basic survival. Honestly, it's just reassuring to know that a billionaire is spending on something other than launching themselves into space. The economic crisis caused by the pandemic has definitely set into motion a new era when it comes to employees' expectation. And with the vast majority of us preferring to work remotely, the struggle to staff in-person hourly jobs could continue for a while. In the meantime, we need to stop hating on millennials for our economically stunted state of adulthood that wasn't created by our overpriced pumpkin spice lattes. Instead, pick on us for things we should actually be ashamed of, like overusing the word slay, creating the term girl boss, or over-identifying with our Hogwarts houses. It's Hufflepuff, but it needs to stop. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2022. Thanks for watching Radar 2022. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, we've all got issues. Some of us more than others.